This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for October 30th through November 5th. On this week's show, we discuss how a group received credit for a song they didn't sing, how wanting to change your image can sometimes be a cautionary tale, and we wish happy birthday to four people who have birthdays on Halloween. Fakeness. It's all the rage these days. There's fake news, or as it used to be called, propaganda or misinformation. There are people who Photoshop their photos or get surgery in order to give themselves curves, bigger lips, whatever. In music, fakeness is running rampant. For instance, there's auto-tuning, which helps people who can't sing sound like they really can. There's, for instance, Iggy Azalea, who fakes a southern hip-hop drawl, even though she has a thick Australian accent. We can discuss appropriating black culture, but that's for a whole other podcast. In her defense, though, there's no real difference between her and actors who fake accents for movie roles, I guess. This whole thing with fakeness in music, though, is nothing new. Back in the years 1989 to 1991, there was an awful lot of fakeness, especially in dance music. You no doubt by now know the story of Millie Vanilli, whose name is now synonymous with fakeness. However, singer Martha Wash was a victim of fakeness due to her weight. CNC Music Factory replaced her in the video for the song Gonna Make You Sweat, Everybody Dance Now, that is with a skinnier singer. The group Black Box did the same thing to her on their song, Strike It Up. Even back in the 1960s, there was fakeness going on. In the early goings of the Monkees TV show, for instance, the group didn't play their own instruments. They learned as time went on. And then, there was a case of this next story. In 1961, the group The Crystals were signed to Phil's Records. Phil's was controlled by legendary producer and, well, former prison inmate, because now he's dead, Phil Spector. Phil produced their first few hits, most of which went to number one. At the same time, there was another group that Phil produced called The Blossoms. They weren't as famous as The Crystals. Their lead singer was Darlene Love, who would later go on to have hits of her own and gain additional fame for playing Danny Glover's wife in the Lethal Weapon movies. There was a song that Gene Pitney penned called He's a Rebel that was making the rounds. Singer Vicky Carr was in the process of recording it, and Spectre wanted to beat her to the punch. As it happened, the Crystals were based in New York City, while Phil and the Blossoms were based in Los Angeles. The Crystals couldn't get to L.A. fast enough, and the Blossoms weren't famous enough to carry the record up the chart, so Phil did what any producer would do at that time. He got the Blossoms to sing the song. However, because they weren't well-known yet, he released the song as The Crystals, denying the Blossoms a number one hit on November 2nd, 1963, even though they were the ones who sang the song. He did that to one more of their songs called He's Sure the Boy I Love, which went to number 11. And then Spectre went back to recording and releasing songs with the Crystals. So when you hear the song He's a Rebel next time, remember that who they say it is isn't really who it really is. He's a Rebel, credited to the Crystals, but really sung by the group The Blossoms, hit number one on the Billboard Singles Chart, on November 2nd, 1963. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This next story is about a man who wanted an image change. It's also sort of a cautionary tale about being careful about what you really want to wish for. In 
See, in the first half of the 1980s, George Michael and Andrew Ridgely, as part of the group Wham!, were one of the biggest groups out there. From 1981 to 1986, they even gave Michael Jackson a run for his money in terms of number of albums sold. Something was bothering George, though. Even though Wham! had serious adult songs like Careless Whisper, they were still considered a silly teeny bopper kind of group. I guess that when you have songs like Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go on your resume, the teeny bopper label's going to stick no matter what you do. At the end of 1986, Wham! decided to break up. George was at a crossroads. He wanted to move on to other things. The first thing he did was to record a song with Aretha Franklin called I Knew You Were Waiting, which became a big hit. And then he went to work on a solo album. He wrote most of the album and played most of the instruments. He released the first single for the album, I Want Your Sex, four months before the album because the song was also on the summer movie blockbuster Beverly Hills Cop 2 soundtrack. The song was controversial due to its subject matter. Even the video for the song was controversial for, among other things, having a half-naked woman in it. In fact, the video ranks at number three on MTV's most controversial videos ever aired list. For George's part, after he put out the song, he really didn't perform it. It was almost as if he was kind of embarrassed for having done the song in the video to begin with. Finally, on October 30th, 1987, George's album Faith came out. By that point, he had released the second song, Faith, with an organ version of his wham hit Freedom at the very beginning of the song. It also had the now iconic music video of him wearing a leather jacket and sunglasses and leaning up against a jukebox and playing guitar. That song was already a big hit when the album came out, so the album already had a good bit of headwind. The album quickly shot up to number one. Eventually, it sold over 20 million copies and won a ton of awards, including the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. Rolling Stone actually has it at number 480 on its Top 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list. And yet, after all of that, including successfully changing his image, something happened. George hated his image. In fact, for his next album, Listen Without Prejudice Volume 1, he only made two videos, neither of which he appeared in. In fact, he addressed his new image in the song Freedom 90. In the video for the song, it featured supermodels and also a slow motion shot of his leather jacket, guitar, and jukebox from the Faith video going up in flames and exploding. As the lyrics of the song said, quote, When I knew what side my bread was buttered, and I took the knife as well, but when you shake your ass, they notice fast, and some mistakes were built to last. End quote. While George had other hits, he basically ran away from fame. He would show up once in a while to give out an award, including one time when he gave one to a very surprised Adele, who idolized George. He also showed up on the very first Carpool Karaoke segment with James Corden. The rest of his career was plagued with run-ins with the law, fights with his record company where he couldn't record for a number of years, and very serious health concerns that he kept away from the public, but would eventually end up claiming his life way too early at the age of 53 on Christmas Day 2016. Still... What a voice and what a personality. George Michael's mega popular album, Faith, released on October 30th, 1987. In keeping with the Halloween holiday, here are four people who have made their mark on music and who each celebrate a birthday on Halloween, October 31st. First off, Larry Mullen Jr. was born in Dublin, Ireland. One day in 1976, his father suggested that he put out an ad on the Mount Temple Comprehensive School Bulletin Board that read, quote, Drummer Seeks Musicians to Form Band, end quote. Among the guys who answered that ad were Paul Bono Hewson, David the Edge Evans, and Adam Clayton. No nickname. Sorry. 
After a few name changes, including Feedback, The Hype, and switching out a couple members, the band settled on the name U2. The band released their first album, Boy, in 1980. That album had the hit I Will Follow. Their second album, October, was released in 1981. At this point in America, a couple of things happened. The first was that the group started getting a reputation for energetic concerts, which led to them getting played on college radio. The second was that U2's music video for the song Gloria got played on some new TV channel called MTV? Never heard of it. Right when MTV was beginning to affect record sales. Although the band wasn't thrilled with the October album because their original ideas were lost in a briefcase during a show to support the Boy album, which meant that they had to rush the recording process during the October album, U2 was hell-bent on getting their next album right. That album was War, personally my absolute favorite U2 album, top to bottom. Released in 1982, the group started to flex its social and political muscles with the songs Sunday Bloody Sunday and New Year's Day. At this point, they also started playing bigger stadiums and festivals, including memorable concerts at the Us Festival, where Bono climbed on the top of the stage rigging, and Red Rock Amphitheater, which was turned into the live EP Under a Blood Red Sky. In 1984, U2 released The Unforgettable Fire, which had the hit Pride in the Name of Love. And by now, U2 was transitioning from college rock band to a stadium act. In 1985, they played Live Aid, where they did a 12-minute version of their song Bad, during which Bono danced with a member of the audience and was quite possibly the second biggest moment from Live Aid after, of course, Queen's. 30-minute masterpiece of a concert. Album number five from U2 was when they hit superstar status. The album The Joshua Tree began their experimentation with American blues, gospel, and folk. The album contained hits I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, With or Without You, Where the Streets Have No Name, and Bullet the Blue Sky. The album won them a number of Grammy Awards. They followed that album up with the album and concert movie Rattle and Hum. Driven by the song Desire, the album sold 14 million copies worldwide. In 1991, after taking some time away from each other due to band tensions, U2 went electronica for their next album, Octung Baby. That album had The Fly, Zoo Station, Mysterious Ways, and One. The album won them a lot of awards, including a Grammy Award, and spawned a huge tour, the Zoo TV Tour, during which Bono came out on stage as various characters. Their next album, Zootopia, continued the electronica trend. They also did a song for the Batman Forever soundtrack called Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, then did an experimental album with Brian Eno called Original Soundtracks 1. Their next album, Pop, was, by their own admission, one of the worst albums they ever made, although there were still a couple of pretty good songs on it. Discotech is a good one, in my opinion, anyway. The boys came back strong, though, with All That You Can't Leave Behind with Beautiful Day and Elevation, which was in the Laura Croft Tomb Raider movie with Angelina Jolie, just so you know. During the tour to support the album, the September 11th attacks happened. The group played a concert at Madison Square Garden in New York City in October, followed by the halftime show of the Super Bowl, where the names of the victims of the attack were scrolled down on a video screen. After that, U2 released How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. That album took home eight Grammy Awards. After that came the albums No Line on the Horizon, Songs of Innocence, and Songs of Experience, which had to be delayed by a year while they rewrote the album to fit the new nationalistic world, because it was right around the time that Donald Trump became president. While there were no hit songs from the album, the group is still a huge concert draw, playing multiple sold-out shows worldwide and even doing a residency at the Sphere in Las Vegas this past year. U2 has sold more than 170 million albums and has won the most Grammy Awards of any band. Currently, that number is 22. Happy birthday to U2's drummer, Larry Mullen Jr. 
born on Halloween, 1961. This next person is a bass player, but not just any bass player. He helped to influence an entire generation of bass players, including John Taylor of Duran Duran, along with more than a few songs like Rapper's Delight and Another One Bites the Dust. And even if you don't know his band Chic with Now Rogers, you know his bass line from his song Good Times. In fact, you're probably humming it right now without even knowing it. Now Rogers was born in 1952 in New York City. In 1970, he and bassist Bernard Edwards, who was born on Halloween, formed two bands called The Boys and The Big Apple Band after meeting while making the rounds in New York City as session musicians. They changed their name to Chic from The Big Apple Band after Walter Murphy and The Big Apple Band became famous with their disco hit A Fifth of Beethoven. They then recruited drummer Donny Thompson, who would later play in the band The Power Station with John and Andy Taylor of Duran Duran and Robert Palmer, who had a pretty successful career of his own. After they got Tony Thompson, they got keyboardist Raymond Jones and singer Norma Jean Wright. The band's debut album in 1977 came out at the perfect time as disco was just beginning to hit its peak. The album had the disco hits Dance, Dance, Dance and Everybody Dance. Due to a solo career contract that Wright had with another record label, she had to leave the band and was replaced by Alpha Anderson. During this time, Nal and Bernard also produced the hit single from Sister Sledge, He's the Greatest Dancer, that went on to be sampled by Will Smith for his song Getting Jiggy With It. 1978's album Sechique had the hit song that inspired the dance craze, Le Freak, which was originally a diss track against Studio 54, who wouldn't let the group in on New Year's Eve 1977 in order to meet singer Grace Jones. The album also had the song, I Want Your Love, which was originally written for Sister Sledge, but the group traded singles with them and let them record He's the Greatest Dancer. 1979's album, Risqué, had the classic song, Good Times, whose bass line inspired artists like Duran Duran's John Taylor to play bass guitar, inspired songs like Queen's Another One Bites the Dust, and was sampled, slapped, ripped off, really, extremely heavily, for the groundbreaking hip-hop single, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Once Sheik broke up the first time in the early 1980s, Rogers went on to write songs for such artists as Sister Sledge and Diana Ross. He also helped to produce albums and songs like In Excess's Original Sin, David Bowie's Let's Dance, and Madonna's Like a Virgin. Tony Thompson went on to play in the power station before passing away from kidney cancer. Bernard Edwards reunited with Now Rogers in the new rendition of the group Chic. He passed away in Tokyo, Japan from pneumonia after playing a gig there with a reunited Sheik. Happy heavenly birthday to the late great bassist for the group Sheik, Bernard Edwards, born on Halloween 1952. Hip-hop plays a part in the next two people's lives. Adam Ad Rock Horowitz was a boy from Manhattan who played punk rock music as a kid. When guitarist John Barry quit a different punk rock band called the Young Aborigines, Adam joined that particular band, and as time went on, his new band changed its sound from punk to a new form of music called hip-hop. They originally had three guys, Adam, Michael Mike D. Diamond, and Adam MCA Youch, and a girl. But the girl, Kate Schellenbach, left the group and is now the drummer for the group Luscious Jackson, who had one major hit of their own called Naked Eye. I digress, though. The rest of this hip-hop band went on to have a massive career and are now members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The band, of course, are the Beastie Boys. The Beasties experimented with hip-hop and put out an EP called Cookie Puss, whose diss track was them actually prank-calling a Carvel ice cream store. Listen, you gotta get your entertainment from somewhere. Besides, it was the 80s. What were you gonna do back then? Be on the internet? There wasn't any. Besides, because Cookie Puss did so well, 
The band decided to go into hip-hop full-time, which is what led to Kate leaving the group to begin with because she wanted to keep playing punk rock. The group hired a DJ for their shows named Rick Rubin, who went to New York University. Rick decided to go into producing and got another friend from NYU named Russell Simmons to form a record label with him. They called it Def Jam Records, and when that was formed, the first group that Rick wanted on it were the Beastie Boys. The group recorded their debut album, which they were going to call something with a homophobic name to it, but the idea was blissfully killed. The group also did something that, at the time, wasn't really too popular. Usually, an artist will put out one, possibly two lead singles from an album before releasing the entire thing. The Beasties released three. They started with Hold It Now in April 1986, then released Paul Revere. A week before they released their album, now called License to Ill, they released the song The New Style. One month after that, the group released the song in the music video that would break things wide open for them. You gotta fight for your right to party. Once that song came out and the video made heavy rotation on MTV, it was off to the races. The group also released Brass Monkey, Girls, and No Sleep Till Brooklyn, which featured a guitar solo from Kerry King from the group Slayer, who Rick was producing at the same time he was producing the Beastie Boys. The album, Licensed to Ill, became one of the fastest-selling albums of all time, eventually selling over 10 million certified copies in America alone. The importance of the album to hip-hop cannot be understated. It became the first hip-hop album to reach number one on the Billboard Albums chart. It also helped to get hip-hop played on MTV, which was finally warming up to the fact that hip-hop wasn't a fad at that point. Go figure. The Beasties, along with Run DMC not much later, made hip-hop cool for suburban kids to listen to. Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer a few years later would water hip-hop down enough, for better or for worse, mainly for worse, so that it would be cool for suburban moms to listen to it, thus completing hip-hop's rise in pop culture to accepted status. Sort of. After that album came classics like Paul's Boutique, Ill Communication, Hello Nasty, Check Your Head, and To the Five Burrows, with singles like So What, So What, So What You Want, Sabotage, Intergalactic, Brass Monkey, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, Paul Revere, You Gotta Fight for Your Right to Party, the list goes on and on and on. On the night of the group's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, one member was missing, Adam MCA Youch. Unbeknownst to the general public, MCA was in the final stages of cancer on that date. He passed away not long after. Mr. Adam Horowitz, better known as King Ad Rock, was born on Halloween 1966. This other guy started out hot, became the brunt of a lot of jokes, but invested his money wisely, unlike a lot of his peers, and is now the host, part-time, of a TV fixer-upper show. He claimed on record and in interviews that he grew up on the streets, but he really grew up in a middle-class neighborhood in Dallas, Texas. See, it brings you back to that whole fakeness thing from the first segment. He also had one of the biggest selling hip hop albums of all time and, like it or not, was actually, along with MC Hammer, one of those guys responsible for rap going completely mainstream, having watered it down so much that even your grandmother liked it. It is his song, Ice Ice Baby, that is actually the first rap song to hit number one on the Billboard singles chart. Not Run DMC, not LL Cool J. He was also sued by Queen and David Bowie for that song sampling their song under pressure without permission. Over the years, he's had run-ins with Suge Knight, been the brunt of a very funny bit done by Jim Carrey on the show In Living Color, and has reinvented himself into a do-it-yourself workman on the DIY network. A big happy birthday to Robert Matthew Van Winkle otherwise known as Vanilla Ice, born on Halloween Day, 1967. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for October 30th through November 5th. 
Thank you very, very much for listening and or watching if you're watching this on Spotify or YouTube. And please hit the like and subscribe button and do all that other stuff that the algorithm loves to do. Have a good day.